get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fog, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, Quest Nutrition, Einstein Bagels, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. We hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Vegas. Others I'm probably missing. If you see value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com. Contact us to find out when and where our next event is going to be. I'm very excited. Today we have Dan Kurzrock, who's co-founder of Regrained. Regrain leverages technology and culinary science to transform beer waste into food, and they call this edible upcycling. You know, Dan, I was surprised when I was doing research to learn that only about 10% of the ingredients used to brew beer end up in your glass. That's crazy. And um, we'll talk about what you do with the rest of it. And Regrain takes the spent grain waste from local brewery partners. And they build recipes around it with other locally sourced ingredients to craft delicious, healthy, and inherently sustainable foods. I can speak from experience because I have bought... A box of regrained. If you can, if you're watching the video, you can see this. And I've already eaten half these. And this is the honey cinnamon IPA. Love it. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm about three quarters of the way through one of. <laughs> one I'm of trying to hold myself stuff. back, so I'm not <laughs> chewing as I'm talking. But you're allowed to because uh, you created yeah. this thing. But um, I'm excited to dive into a couple things. And I know it started trying to make extra beer money. By baking goods with leftover grains when you're home brewing in college, and it turned into, I guess, doing a small part or soon to be large part to save the world, essentially. Um, but tell me about the first product you created in the kitchen. Sure, sure, yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you for having me on on your show. Really, yeah, so definitely. Be here. So when we were, well, I was 19 at the time, so couldn't buy beer, um, but could learn that I could buy the ingredients and from uh, <laughs> roommate and a very close friend. Just ah, a loophole. Got it. A loophole. Yeah. It's, it's the ultimate loophole for a True college entrepreneur. Student. And so really fell in love with the hobby. I mean, not just because I loved beer, which of course I did, um, but also because just making something from scratch is a really you know rewarding activity to participate in. And... What we discovered uh, as we were brewing beer, it became an every week kind of thing. Didn't have class on Friday. Um, thank you, quarter system. And uh, every time we made beer, we found that we were left with all this food. And it felt really wasteful to just toss it out. We didn't have a farm. We didn't have even a compost. What did you do? Just toss it in the garbage? Yeah, there's a big time? dumpster out front yeah. that, uh, you know, we'd take this giant cooler. You know, think of like a Gatorade cooler. That You know, that's what our equipment was, was a modified a uh, sports cooler like that uh, that's full of what appears to be oatmeal. It's actually very similar to oatmeal, except it's barley. Um, and after we'd soak it in the water and drain the, the sugar, sugary liquid out, it's called wort, that would go on to become beer, we'd have this like massive amount of uh, what smelled and tasted like food, and we were just dumping it. It felt really wasteful. Um, so kind of a light bulb went off um, for, for, for me, uh, especially growing up in you know, I'm a California born and bred kind, yes, of, yes. kind of guy and grew up in a household that was yeah, all yeah. about, um, you know, protecting the planet and, you know, re- reducing waste and, you know, valuing our, our natural environment and all that good stuff. And so really what the, what, what occurred to, to me was that there has to be something else to do with this. Um, you know, what are other people doing? And from research, I found that other home brewers had a pretty rich history of making bread out of the grain. So the first product we made was bread, figured if we could make beer, could probably figure out how to make bread and got to baking loaves. It was pretty rudimentary. We honestly were just taking scoops of this wet grain and adding it into the dough and we'd make so it kind wasn't of this. even processing it at all. It was just, right no, in there. it was just toss it in there. Let's see what happens. What came out was it tasted a lot like a kind of a whole wheat bread, maybe with some like seed or, you know, oat inclusions and, 
it wasn't amazing, but it was it was fresh and it was it was pretty good, good enough that you know when we were making it, our the same friends who, you know, were very interested in our in our home brewing activities. I was living in a fraternity house at the time. That's probably worth mentioning. So there's people around uh, a lot. And they would smell the bread and, you know, we'd say, oh, well, you know, happy to, to sell you a loaf of bread. Uh, and we'd sell, you know, five bucks a loaf or something like that. Mm. Um, and they, you know, they were really excited about the story of what the main ingredient was. And so we kind of started doing that every week in order to brew beer for free. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, the, okay, there's all the stuff left behind. What do we do with it? What we learned through our research also pretty early on was that this uh, material is actually really nutritious. Uh, it's got a lot of protein. It's got a lot of fiber. Really, it's the the brewing process processes the sugars out of the grain. So there's a lot of kind of misconception that because this is called spent grain, that it's devoid of of value, uh, which couldn't be further uh, from the truth. You know, we see, especially now that we have a, a, an actual company with an internet, internet presence, you get people commenting, "Oh, you know, all the good stuff ends up in the beer." It's like, well, the good stuff. Have you drink beer? beer? Right? Like beer. it's not that, it's not that <laughs> healthy for you. <laughs> <laughs> but all the all the healthy stuff is 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 left behind, and and what we're proposing to do is to is to close the loop on that through something that we call that we call upcycling, and um, you know it's got massive potential. It's not a not an entirely new idea. It makes com- it's common sense. Um, you know, it's actually a lot of people don't realize that whey protein is a byproduct of, of making cheese, and that's exactly. of course a, a nutritious staple of, of of our food system as well. So. Um, starting with bread, but you know, yeah. So talk about the on. evolution of the product a little bit. So it started with the bread. Then what? What did you make next? So what we realized with bread making? Uh, have you ever made bread before? Yes, but I used a machine and a mix to make nice. the bread. Yes. So that makes it a little easier, but it still takes a long time. Yeah. Um, maybe it's not the most involved process. Yeah, it's annoying. Yeah, yeah, but it take, takes time. Yeah. Uh, which. Is fine if you're making a few few loaves, but if you're trying to grow a business, you know that that proves prohibitive. You need uh, like a thousand bread makers or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We even like started making the dough and freezing the dough and trying to figure out ways to do it more efficiently. But then there's the other problem of okay, after you've made this this bread, it's not it's only fresh. It goes bad a day, yeah. right? So we early on identified um, that the opportunity here was to kind of create, try and create this, this new ingredient and create a market for that, that new ingredient. This was after the original idea of, okay, we should start a brewery that's also a bakery. i um, still kind of want to do that later in life. Um, and, but we knew that we needed to, to bring a, a kind of ready-to-eat product to market to uh, teach people about the value that, totally. that it's being overlooked. Yeah, I mean, I interviewed one guy, the Osiri Bakery, and I remember halfway through, and I said, why did you get in this business? All your product goes bad. What do you do with all the product? He's like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tough business. Yeah. yeah, you can actually turn it back into beer. There's a really cool there company out there in the UK go. called Toast. They're, uh, so we're eat your beer, and they're drink your toast, and they take uh, old bread and turn oh, it back into beer. Super I awesome. You email them. Let them know. Yeah, yeah I'll put, I'll put you in touch. They're, they're great people. Um, and so what our you know brilliant college minds came up with as a next move was to make snack bars. Um, we tried granola first, and we're like, okay, well, granola's cool, but we, you know, we're bikers, hikers, skiers, you know, that we had a lot of bars. Um, there weren't actually that many on the market at the time. This is back in 2010. Yeah. Um, and so we figured, okay, well, let's make a bar. And we started packaging them in Ziploc bags. Uh, and then pretty soon thereafter, we got our first compostable wrappers that we were hand sealing, um, selling those to friends. And so we, we moved on to the bar. The original wrappers, Dan, where did you get them? Yeah. Did you just buy them in bulk? or so Compostable films, there's a bunch of – it's not entirely new technology. What's changing is that they're getting, they're getting better. And so the film that we use now is also um, home compostable. We started mm. with something that was uh, – Like this one. This one here is you can yeah. compost that in your home okay got it yeah that's cool. not common we can spend i can spend a lot more time talking about that yeah. it's something we're passionate about uh but our first wrappers were just cello based you know cello is um you know, cellulose and it, it's it, can't remember the original sun sun chips bag and how like loud and crinkly it was it was kind of like that um and the seals were terrible and you know, but for us, we define like pretty early on. We we realize that what we're doing here, you know, it's, it's very mission driven. We're all about reducing waste and feeding people, yeah. and that we need to have some non negotiable values around those things, um, especially as it relates to packaging. You know, a lot yeah. of companies don't like to admit that they're also in the yeah. future. Trash. If you're like, if we did edible upcycling and then had, you know, non recyclable or non compostable yeah. packaging, that would be a little bit of a 
let's you know, fill the issue. Yeah. Let's let's do the right thing in you know all areas all the time is right. really what we're like, we're all about. So, so snack bars, and that's where it is today. You guys are, but there's yeah. a future to that, right? Yeah. So right now, I think when I checked out your site and I bought the honey cinnamon IPA, there's a chocolate coffee stout. You have a blueberry sunflower, um, and those are the products. And I want to talk about why those products, but there's a future to that, right? So what's totally. next? Yeah, totally. So we just we we started making the bars a while ago, and we've kind of gone through a few generations of them. Um, learning how to play with this ingredient and also yeah. you know what what we needed to do in order to differentiate yeah. the bar in the marketplace Why those flavors uh, the honey cinnamon is a, just a great balanced flavor that's pretty familiar very approachable and um, yeah. we actually are using manuka honey I know I saw that health properties um, yeah why you went premium with that if yeah you go to the store and buy manuka honey I think I saw it. It was like seventy dollars or something for a jar of it. For like a jar that's like that big. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, uh, of course. There's wholesale pricing that's a little better than that. It is a premium it's, it's ingredient. It has. We were using it for its yeah. for its yeah. functional uh, for its functional benefits. So all of yeah. our bars have have functional benefits. The, the bar is a vehicle to introduce the super grain, which is you know upcycled and it's prebiotic and it's a source of plant based protein. I mean, you have uh, turmeric in this thing. Uh huh. Yeah. Turmeric. So that one's our that one's our immunity bar, and then mm. our chocolate coffee stout bar is our energy bar. So it's got uh, coffee. It also has coffee fruit, which is the byproduct from the coffee harvesting um, process. That's got some really interesting. You're gonna start seeing a lot more of that. Um, and it's got ginseng in that one as well. And then we've got our blueberry sunflower saison, which is antioxidant. It's got um, it's got blueberries and cranberries, and it's got um, ginger. Um, you came out with the honey and chocolate together, or was it were they separate? So all three, we launched all three of these at the oh, same time. Okay. But in years past, we've had different, like earlier, like you know, like beta versions, I guess, of our of our IPA and of our stout. And so we went to market with the three skews, the three you know three flavors of the mm-hmm. bars, um, because that's that represents a full set in terms of the the grocery store. We can expand from there. But what we're really excited about is that these bars. Are introducing the regrained flour, which is um, you know through our, the process that we've invented uh, in, in, in partnership with the USDA to, to take this material and turn it into something that's not only viable as a food ingredient but also desirable, and it can be used in um, like incredibly broad array of applications. So we're actually going to go savory next. Um, our next product is going to be an, an innovative kind of savory savory can snack. You talk about it. What's going to be, or is this uh, under uh, lock and key right well, now? There's, no, I, I mean, I can talk about some of the things that we're thinking. Um, you know, we've got uh, some really exciting prototypes of, of like a pretzel kind of as a technique. Um, so not like a braided pretzel, but like a, that kind of format. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can do some interesting flavors with that. Uh, but we've, the, the crazy thing is that what we've learned is that we're not really limited by where we can go with this ingredient, which is not necessarily true of all functional ingredients. It's mm-hmm. more so where we should go so we can make crackers cookies chips pastas breads you know we, we, we've done um tests on, on on a lot of different types of products and we've been pretty consistently blown away with how how well it plays at pretty high uh, inclusions which is um you know really pretty pretty special and will you uh, just sell the flour too yeah, so our, our vision is to take, and, and what we're actively working towards is we're using our, our brand, of ready, which creates ready-to-eat products, in order to introduce the market to this ingredient. And then what we, what, what we want to do is take that, that brand equity that we're building and uh, then use that as like an intel inside for other, other food companies. So working with other food companies to use our ingredient that already have massive distribution and, and marketing. Because really, if you think about what our, what our goal is, it's to close this loop. And I can make close to a million pounds of our flour from a single brewery in a single city. Yeah. And so in order for us to really feed as many people as possible with this really overlooked um, ingredient stream, you know, we, we need to uh, get really creative in how we are you know, bringing it into the marketplace. And we want to do that as a, as a branded ingredient so that people know that from Regrain they can expect uh, products that are higher in protein, that are higher in fiber, that you know, have the added benefits of you know help, help, helping the planet and always tasting great that's the most important yeah thing. i'm curious dan um there's so many ideas right and there's so many places you go how do you guys brainstorm you and jordan brainstorm out these different things like you can do the flour you can do pretzels you can do another mm-hmm. flavor of granola i mean there's there's infinite possibilities what's sure. your process do you do this once a week 
Do you do this once a month? What does it look like? Do you have a big wall that you've painted? Like, just uh, give me the visual of what that looks like. The the best brainstorming honestly happens when you're not trying to do it, um, is what we found. So we came up with this idea while skiing together. Jordan and I actually grew up together, um, and uh, we went to the same high school, same college, and so we share a lot of you know hobbies like that. And we find that when we create the space where we're doing other activities, that's mm. that's often when the best ideas happen. And then of course we, we we socialize them with one another. So skiing is something that we both love. Cycling for you know for me is uh, kind of like my you know my yoga. It's, you know it's like meditative, um, and that's where things click. And then just a lot of we do have conversations and we're trying to, you know, as we grow our team, like we, now we have seven, seven people that are working with us, you know, take, figuring out how to take what's worked for, for us, you know, up until this point and creating the structure so that our team can really gel and, 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 and thrive, you know, together is, is important. But I would say that, you know, most of our, our best thinking, you know, happens outside of the, outside of the office. Is that planned or is it just like, Oh, we're going to go biking you know, every so often we know we're going to talk about new products or is it just more of a, a casual, no. when it happens, it happens. No, it's more like the way my philosophy about it is that we need to create the space for ourselves to, to let those moments yeah. of creativity happen. Um, and sometimes it's just going to be a bike ride, you know, and uh, sometimes you might have a, have a lot on your mind. Um, you know, bike ride for me, bike ride biking is more, you know, that's not, it's independent of, of Jordan. We don't really do that together so much, but the skiing, um, you know, is we, we, we call, we do something we would call our, uh, you know, annual powwow and the pow pow. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> we go up to Tahoe and, um, to reflect on our previous, you know, year in our business and what we want to accomplish this year. And, you know, the last two years we've actually been able to bring up our team to do that. Um, and, you know, like having that kind of also just creates an appreciation for, for, the outdoors and the natural environment, which is really what we're, um, you know, all about protecting, right. And just kind of solving this environmental crisis that we've gotten ourselves into. Yeah. So Dan, I want to talk about the process a little bit, the logistics process, but before I do that, I want to hear about, I know you talked to Tom, the founder of TerraCycle, and I want to get some behind the scenes of what you guys chatted about because two sustainable, you know, companies and what was, what did you guys talk about? Sure. Yeah. And, and thanks again for that, that introduction. That was, uh, connecting with Tom is, you know, kind of like connecting with the, um, you know, one of the, really the, the forefather of the upcycling space. I describe what we do as a business, um, as like TerraCycle for, for food waste, you know, what right. we're doing is take, taking things that, that maybe would have traditionally seen the end of their supply chain and, um, creating a, a circular economy with them and, and finding the highest totally. use materials one of the things that we i mean it was mostly just our first, we just met so we we're just getting getting to know each other quickly and you know we're going to look at some ways that uh we can um partner on some some packaging initiatives so really key for us is actually compostable packaging so packaging that will go away and it's not based in you know, a lot of packaging is also based uh made out of petroleum so it's you know reducing the i didn't know that those plastic those plastic inputs and um creating something that you know shelf stable but also will go away um really important for for our mission of, of reducing waste and they, they've done some great work around taking the company because most of the market doesn't use compostable films and so what do you do with those and they've kind of created you know one part of their business model is creating creating markets for those materials to create durable goods like bags and things like that um but the challenge with compostable films one of any is that most consumers aren't going to don't compost at home and don't have access in their city to municipal compost. So, you know, how might we, um, you know, implement something like a collect and compost, you know, program together? You know, mm. that's the, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're, you know, excited to figure out how we might, you know, play together and, uh, hopefully they're a much, you know, much, much bigger, much more established company that's been doing some great work and we'd love to, you know, thought, thought partner with them and, you know, kind of co-create a more sustainable future together, you know, through, through collaboration. I think that's, that's really what we need to do, uh, right now, uh, you know, in the business community is, you know, of all the companies that give a shit, you know, let's, uh, let's rally together and figure out ways that we can, that we can help and support each other and, and make, um, you know, basically change business as usual, um, to be regenerative and not, you know, extractive. Yeah. It seemed like, you know, this comes, I always find with, with people and entrepreneurs, this comes from somewhere, 
this inherent nature to do something. And I, when I was reading and doing research on you, it seems like part of that came from your grandfather. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I love my, but so I love my family in general, and we're all kind of kind of crazy. But this my my father's father uh, is especially uh, awesome and, and nutty. And you know, even growing up, I remember we'd be bite, we're driving somewhere, and he'd see something shiny on the side of the road, and we'd have to pull over to see what it was, and it would be a you know like a, a wrench or something that was <laughs> maybe you know the same one that he has in his garage, anyways. But you know, he's got a. <laughs> uh, got to recover that, that that kind of thing uh so yeah that that kind of ethos was definitely you know around um from very early on he was also the the person that i've become which is oh you're gonna you're gonna finish that you know can I, <laughs> you know clear other people's no plates waste. for them yeah yeah no no waste human you know we joke that uh, well, actually a lot of my brothers too you know we're kind of like human garbage disposals when it comes to to food you know we're uh <laughs> but uh, and then how do you take take that that mentality and uh, apply it in a in a business setting to create a um, you know that, that, so a lot of it you know it was it was founded uh it, you know kind of rooted in um in in family values and also um cultural cultural values um growing up for me and I'm not a religious person but I grew up uh going to like Jewish summer camps and a big a big part of of, of that which actually where I met my met my wife were kind of one of those disgusting You met at the Jewish stores. summer camp? At a Jewish summer camp, ah. yeah, when we were eighteen, um, and one of the things there is, is this idea of uh, tikkun olam, which is like repairing the earth. And you know, from a very young age, you know, in every session, you do do activities around repairing the earth, and it kind of gave you know that combined with the family, va- you know, the cultural values combined with the family values of having a, a sense of ownership over our planet and over creating a better future for generations to come. Uh, really just, I guess, filled both me and me and Jordan, who has a similar background in that respect with this sense of sense of purpose and also a sense of agency and, you know, a belief that we can, mm-hmm. that we can make a difference. And that, um, what did you want to do, crazy. Dan, when you were growing up? Because it seemed like when you went to UCLA, you, I think went, were in business school. So did you always want to start your own business or? What? Yeah. So at, the, at that point, I'd kind of abandoned my dreams of becoming an astronaut um, <laughs> which is what I really wanted to do growing up, but uh, yeah, I can't. Really, I've actually got a blind eye and learn that you can't you do could, that. Maybe, so, you could know, maybe you know SpaceX. They send you maybe yeah. At some point. Maybe it'll got to figure out what I can upcycle up up in the up in the atmosphere, um, stratosphere. So, growing coming into UCLA, I, I I wasn't sure what what I wanted to do. I don't think I would have. In retrospect, I had already you know I demonstrated some entrepreneurial tendencies in high school. Um, through like from my youth group I was the one that was making and selling the merchandise to raise money for example um and then decided to do that on on the side and made some like you know, kind of novelty frisbees and things like that uh but coming into school I, I was originally thinking oh I'll just you know I like to talk and read and argue and I'll go to law school uh, <laughs> uh part way through well, you didn't go you didn't go to law school I did not go to law school. I did end up going to business school. Um, as and then I also so and then you look back at like what my job was in college, and I was selling ads for the school newspaper, um, which was you know fun to convince people that print print media was a, a good investment. Um, <laughs> and really, just identified that my passions were really around sustainability and um, around. Really, it's just like a belief in, in businesses' ability to create an outsized impact relative to to an individual. Um, and looking at companies like like Patagonia and um, you know Cliff Bar and you know, TerraCycle and thinking, okay, like doing something like that could be really cool. And, it, and along the same time, I was you know stumbled into this this concept that uh, felt really novel and really very real and very important. Um, and so. Probably by my junior by my junior year, towards the end of my junior year of college, I knew that uh, you know Jordan and I knew that regrand was our was our goal. We we didn't yeah. believe that we would do that right after school, because um, we felt like we didn't know anything about the world. Yeah. yeah uh, so what did you do? You um, were you still continuing to work on regrand as you left college? Yeah. So we described this period as our as our recreational entrepreneurship period, and it was kind of a, a good way for us to. I guess had probably hedge our, our risk and also um, in food, you know, we're not building like the next Google or something like that. That's just going to have explosive growth, right? It's uh, 
we wanted to grow with intention and, and create something of, of lasting value, um, ideally, you know, across generations. And so we realized, we decided that we could, um, continue to move forward, but yeah. do so, you know, at a, at a pretty measured clip. And so I went and I got a job and I graduated college in 2012. It was right as, um, you know, this, I guess, cloud computing, you know, tech boom was happening. And, uh, so a lot of these startups were, were hiring and, uh, I got a job at a, at a pretty early stage, kind of approaching middle stage software company, uh, based in San Francisco, well, San Mateo, like 15 minutes from my folks house, mm-hmm. uh, kind of jumped at the opportunity to join another startup to see what I could learn, uh, there, even though it was not the same, same industry. Um, Jordan, similar mentality, except he went to go work straight for a food company. And so he, um, he yeah, so there was a, a collection of a food business. They had a few restaurants, a catering business, a market, and a liquor store that all was like hyper local. Everything was sourced within 100 miles. And mm-hmm. he was kind of second, and he got a, a job basically being the, the business manager, so second to the, to the owner of the business. And he was really the key operator there and learned a lot about the food system and you know the kind of the value chain and um you know as we were growing a brand that looks to kind of sell into that being on the on the other side of it in terms of like the distribution and the sale to the consumer it was a really valuable experience for him but we both kind of hit this point where we um the rate at which we were learning from these other jobs was was diminishing and the opportunity cost of time spent away from growing regrained was increasing and so that was that was the point that we knew. Okay, let's let's uh, let's dedicate ourselves. It's to a tough decision, this. though. It was, but we made it. You know, a lot of people make it out to be this like massive. Hey, let's like take the leap. You know, you, you, you like to make it really dramatic. And everyone. How were you ran- keeping it going during that time? Like, what were you we doing? Did it, we did it on nights and weekends, uh-huh. and we kind of had this starvation cycle of not literally starvation, but for the business where we well, would like with spend your a whole weekend. with your products. I mean, you'll you always be able to eat, right? So yeah, exactly. You'll always, yeah. That's the good thing about going into the food business. And so we'd spend a whole weekend making product, and then we'd spend the whole weekend selling all the product that we had, and then we'd be out of product again, uh, you know, doing farmer's markets. California passed something in 2012. Timing is, is really important, and as an entrepreneur, being able to recognize when the timing is good to take, take action is, you know, is, is critical. And, and, and for us, we got really lucky in that uh, California voters passed a bill in uh, 2012 so that at the beginning of 2013, it became legal to have a home kitchen, like a a certified home kitchen. Mm. Uh, It's called the Cottage Foods Bill. And so what we were able to do is actually legally create an entity and legally register with the state and county and start actually in in a more formal way, as opposed to the informal sales we were doing in college, put put ourselves out there and figure out if people, you know, other than, um, you know, our friends and, and, and family were actually passionate about about this idea and wanted to see it you know be successful and would buy our buy our products and so we were able to have a real business that was a hobby uh, that was generating revenue and at the time we weren't paying ourselves anything so we joke actually that you know we were we were cash flow positive then actually uh, because we didn't have like right. almost any expenses and we worked on our our under you know our developing our business model and uh, really the most challenging thing about what we're building here is this kind of vertically integrated supply chain around taking the grain from the breweries and turning it into an ingredient. And so, right. um, sending some of that, that in motion. So we, we both had full time jobs, but we were still, you know, working on, on this. And so what yeah. it did is it made what most people would like to describe as this big leap of faith that, you know, if you really believe in your idea, you have to go do, um, and turn it into a bunch of smaller steps. Um, so we could, you know, walk, walk down, the ledge and up onto the other one instead of like having to leap. Yeah. Massive. I guess the, 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 the consideration for people is, well, at what point do you decide to do that? Right. Is it like, okay, when we start generating enough money in the business or is it when we have a certain amount of savings and we're just gonna yeah. do it? How do you, do you decide when the time was to make that step? Yeah. Cause it's never like, that never seems like the perfect time. Right. I think it's, I mean, I, I don't have kids yet, but I'm told that it also similarly, yeah. like it it's never like seems like kid. there's no perfect time. But there's yeah. no perfect time. And so all you can do is we always say that you, it's kind of a silly statement, but we always say that you only know what you know when you know it. <laughs> right. Um, and that's incredibly true in, in, in business. And, you know, for us, it got to that, that point that I was describing where time spent away from the business made it seem like we were you know losing 
ground that, mm-hmm. that we could that we knew how to be covering if we only had the time to and so we started by investing more of our time in the business um, and then got that to the point where we could invest well, other people's money in, in the business and confidently know that we could that we could grow that money and you know turn it into more more money so it, it was just that if we didn't take action if we didn't start doing this um, full time we would the we would just kind of be acute boutique business and that wasn't our that wasn't our goal Your vision. Um, so, yeah and so we decided. so talk about that for a second bootstrapping versus yep. investment so at what point do you take on investment i want to talk a little about the equity crowdfunding which i missed out on which i'm very upset about right now <laughs> sure yeah so we started with bootstrapping which for us meant um getting a product to market even if it wasn't perfect and just starting to sell it yeah. And using that as that kind of cycle to yeah. uh, basically kind of validate have re- everything. And- yeah, it's like revenue generating marketing and revenue generating pro- prototypes. Yeah. Um, and then we did our first actual just tr- rewards based crowdfunding in 2015. So we said to the world, hey, we want to order better packaging, basically, um, but we don't have the money to do it. And, you know, help us bring this to market. Um, and so it's basically pre-orders. It's not investment, and we got about thirty thousand dollars in, in pre-orders of of, of of our product. Um, when we were ready to focus on the business full time, you know, we we needed to we we needed to be able to live, right? And so one of the you know, and we needed to grow a team, and you know, we needed we needed more money than we had in order to grow, right? And that, I mean, that's a classic kind of investment thesis: is that you you just need these these outside resources in order to to do the things you need to do. And so we made the decision to um, raise some money from friends and family and, and angel investors. Um, mission alignment was really important. You know, a lot of, especially in the food space, there's kind of this playbook for, okay, start a business, raise some money, get to a certain market size, and then sell as quickly as possible. And that's that, that's never been our goal. And so we had to make sure through pretty heavy vetting that our investors, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they want exit, or a lot of them want exit in a few years, or, or, something like or that. at least they want yeah. a financial return, right? And we fully intend to generate competitive financial returns for our investors. I mean, at our core, we're turning trash into money, right? Like the, this business model is not a charity. You know, it, it is using. You know, we we are being we are being rewarded by the market for solving. The problem, right? You know, and that's that, the, and that's okay. You know, we're a for-profit, purpose-driven business, um, and but Jay, there's a difference between having investors that are interested in financial return and competitive financial returns um, versus investors that want an exit, you know, as soon as possible. Um, and so, you know, that yeah. was really that was really important for us. And then we just, as you kind of alluded to, we we layered in this pretty innovative. Uh, new instrument for investment uh, that actually just concluded last Friday, um, which is equity crowdfunding. So typically when you're in, it, it's, it's a challenge to kind of wrangle a lot of investors that are writing small checks. And so you set a minimum and you also are supposed to, and it's also a lot uh, simpler if you focus on something called accredited investors. So these are people with, with higher net worths. Um, and you know, you try and get them to write you, you know, maybe it's like a $25,000 check or $50,000 check. And, um, that's, you know, because of how much time it takes to, to work with every investor, that's kind of what, what, what you do. Um, but with equity crowdfunding, it uses that same kind of platform that, you, that we're used to with rewards-based crowdfunding. And thanks to, you know, new, new regulations coming into play, it makes it so that um, just, you know, retail investors you know, and anyone um, can, can get in for not crazy amounts of money. Our minimum investment was 100 bucks. So we had over 700 people um, yeah. that across them invested a, a total of $730,000 uh, in, our, in our business that just concluded on Friday, which is a super on-mission thing for us, too. Not only do we need the resources to grow, but these are all people that really believe in what we're, in, in, in what we're building. And we're also democratizing access to early investing in early-stage ventures, which is typically – you know, it's very because it's, it's a very risky proposition, right? But it's typically very, um, you know, restricted. Yeah, you do it because you believe in it, and there's, I mean, there was amazing perks around it too. Besides it, but people do it because you're going to be the next best thing since sliced bread, literally, right? So, right, and we could, and we could be the next sliced bread. Yeah, you know, we made some um, awesome breads. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing because you there's a hundred dollar, two hundred fifty, five hundred, a thousand, three thousand, five thousand, yeah. ten thousand. Someone put someone put in a hundred thousand dollars. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So a hundred thousand was that was the largest, and a hundred dollars was the smallest. Yeah, and we had everything in between. So how do you decide just to close it? You said sixty days. You decided to close yeah, so you it. Yeah, then... you, you set a time at the at the beginning. Yeah, and you set a goal um, as well. You know, the goal on the site was it, like the minimum for for all these campaigns is fifty fifty thousand um, dollars. So if you don't get fifty thousand dollars, you don't get any of it. Uh, but it can go up to a million. Our goal was to, because this is part of a, a broader strategy for us to kind of raise, you know, mission aligned and strategic money to to take our business to the next level. Um, we were hoping to have this come in somewhere around two hundred and fifty. You know, maybe best case five hundred. You know, obviously exceeded that, um, which we're, we're we're thrilled about. So, how do you do? You open it again in the future, or no? Not probably not. Probably not this. You know, so for us, you know, this is a seed. We're in a seed stage, so we're still pretty small. Mm-hmm. We're still growing. Um, this will help us get to you know what in the space is known. Is, venture space is known as a Series A, which will uh, kind of for us it'll be the milestone of being ready to scale our technology and our business model uh, globally. Um, so that's what we're that's what we're working towards. Um, and well, I that, think you should open again now right. for the next hour. You'll, you'll, you'll fill it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to press you on it until you do it. Um, who do you hire first? So you, it was just, you know, it's you and Jordan. Yeah. Who are the next so hires? We, we hired um, four people, uh, basically all at the same time. And we hired people that initially, these weren't experts. You know, these weren't, we, we hired people that could be entrepreneurs within our entrepreneurial venture and you know, act like owners and really own their domain. And so kind of the buckets that we have people in are sales um, and then we call it community management, which is basically all the you know marketing. So everything from our like direct to consumer sales to, to events and, and things which like that. Which is important, especially in a mission driven company. You know? mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then we've got a operations guy whose job is to just like get shit done basically uh, i should have checked if i can swear on your show i'm sorry about that um totally fine. and then we've got a, a product guy that is a he's a chef and he's also got he's not a phd food scientist or anything like that but he has some food science training and so he's you know, not only overseeing our production but also you know recipe recipe development so we kind of just looked at what what were the different things that were all parts of mine and Jordan's job? You know, we divide things as Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside. Like, I grow the business. You make sure that our business can grow. Um, and what are the things that we could hire people that are better than us at so that we can focus on the things that we're best at as, as, as founders? Um, and really just create a culture of, of owning our, our mission and, you know, the, the purpose of, of – Using business as a force for as a force for good, um, so that's what we've you know been thrilled to be able to do for the last year and kind of entering our second yeah. year with these with this you know founding team. So Dan, um, what's really interesting to me, same thing, sort sort of similar to what I made the comment to the guy with the bread company. This sounds really difficult and really hard. Stuff goes bad. This does not sound easy. Um, you know, I picture the beginning stage is like borrowing someone's truck and going to these breweries and like picking up this stuff, right? What uh-huh. was the first iteration of, okay, you contact the brewery and you're like, we're going to yeah. come pick up this stuff and then yeah, talk about what it looks like now, but talk about yeah, early for, on what that looks like. Except for our truck, it was a Subaru. A Subaru, okay. <laughs> gotcha. um, so talk, should, walk me through the first time you contacted. Yeah, well, so what happened was we had this transition where we, we were initially just use, making beer, and using our own grain, right? right? And then our vision was to become a solution for the breweries. Right. Uh, but it was hard for us to fathom ever needing more grain than we would generate from a single day of making beer. It's about a pound of grain per six pack of beer. Uh, and so we'd have, you know, these big buckets from just making our own beer. But it got to the point where we were doing these, these farm workers markets. And there's a few times where we realized, okay, we kind of have to make beer in order to have the grain. And that's kind of silly. So let's, uh, well, let's call well, you're in a frat house. You could do it. Not, not, well, not at the time we were at our, like oh, gotcha. Jordan's parents kitchen. And, and so we called around, made some cold calls to breweries. I'm very comfortable just doing that. Um, that's like, kind of what I was, what I was doing for work at the time anyways. And, we got in touch with the breweries, told them who we were, what we were doing, and um, you know, a brewery uh, said, "Sure, come on down. You're welcome to were have." Were there have any a- objections? 
Were they like, oh, we are to give it to this for X, Y, Z, or was it pretty seamless? No, it was pretty seamless. I mean, there's so the historical paradigm for how this this grain is handled is that it's it's uh, been used for for animal feed. Yeah. Uh, and, but the amount of grain that we were going to be taking initially was, was so low that it wasn't going to be disruptive to any existing relationships. And actually what we learned was that urban breweries, it's a cost center for them uh, because farmers uh, are, are less willing to come into the city to get mm. the grain. So uh, typically, they, if it's more in a, like a rural area, the farmers may pay for this like at a low cost to feed their animals. But they're not mm-hmm. going to travel that far distances to do yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, if you're a farmer, you know, are you going to drive your... You know, big truck across, you know, in bridge, Chicago, you know, no. deal with yeah. Your, yeah, deal with traffic, deal with you know everything. So exactly. So these urban breweries have a bit of a different ecosystem that um, you know we can play a really, uh, we hope you know to play a really significant role in. But this first brewery was super open to us doing it. We came on by, but we learned a very important lesson because we showed up and all the grain was just in a dumpster uh, behind the the brewery you know which wasn't which is not food safe of course so <laughs> it's a food safe dumpster yeah no not yeah, so, so much so it, so it occurred to us that um in working with these breweries we needed to be have a have a pretty deep partnership with them where they where we can create food food safe you know gold standard processes and yeah. um another kind of funny story with picking up grain that was another food safety lesson was we uh, were working with a brewery and they were making a stout which is an oyster stout um, turns out that the way this particular brewery does it is they actually run the beer through a bunch of oysters and then back through the grain. And so there was like oyster remnants, you know, shellfish in the, in the grain. And they were like, Oh, we can't take that. So that, you know, that helped us realize, okay, we got to also not only food safety in terms of like the process of, of collecting, you know, we call it the harvest, you know, harvesting the grain and turning it into regrained. Um, but also knowing what, their supply, you know, I guess their supply chain and what they're. Yeah. What it's probably a pain for them, I imagine, if they're used to just throwing it in a dumpster or something. Now they want, you want them to the thing kind is, of package it, right? I mean, the thing is, is that we're taking something for these breweries that has historically been um, basically cost and risk. Um, you know, even the ones that are making, you know, generating some revenue off of it, it's, it's pretty, pretty marginal. And we're turning it into something that's all, that's all upshot. And brewers inherently, beer is, a lot of people forget beer is an agricultural product and brewers are very connected and by and large to, to the land and to, um, being stewards of, of our planet. Um, and so, you know, from a, like philosophical level, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this, for what we're doing. It's been kind of an open secret in the industry for a long time that this is a pretty overlooked resource and they're, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're excited to see us come in and, and propose propose a new a new solution and we're making a very just to be perfectly candid we're making a very small dent on the total volume oh, yeah. of, I think of potential food in that's the up. research i don't remember if it was someone one of the brewers that you worked with or there was some quote i don't know if it was thirty thousand pounds a week per brewery or something like of this grain is that yeah, about so accurate that, that, that's like a medium-sized brewery yeah that's a lot that's a lot. Yeah, you know, that's that's absolutely a lot. One and with brewery, our, one and, week. Yeah, yeah. And with our and with our bars, uh, you know, where there's only so much grain that we can divert with that, which is why we're so excited about what we're doing with our flour and some of the development that we're doing with other other food companies around incorporating our signature ingredient into their into their recipes, um, because there is still a massive you know loop to be to be closed and you know we, we aim to do that through this technology that we've created and patented with the usda and also through the brand that we're building and kind of the goodwill with the marketplace that we're doing where we're redefining something that used to be known as as you know the artist formerly known as spent grain is now regrained super grain that um, is you know high protein high fiber makes an impact uh on saving the planet so so uh, the first iteration is you take your Subaru and <laughs> yeah. you pick it up. What was it contained in at the time? Uh, just like food safe tubs, basically. Tubs. You know, big, big containers that, you know, you, if you like go to the back of a restaurant and you see like big plastic containers um, that are, uh, you know, rated for, you know, food, yeah. food handling. And then there's bigger and bigger versions of that. And now what, what, how is it picked up? Now we have trucks. Yeah, so it's, I mean, uh, are the trucks loaded 
just they're separate? Uh, do you contract the company, or do you actually have people in the staffing who actually helps with the logistics of, of picking this stuff up? Yeah, right now it's it's overseen by our by our operations manager. We handle it so that this is something that we can't. It's so important uh, to do it correctly. We can't outsource the we can outsource the production of the bars. We're actually going to be doing that pretty soon. And when we make other products, we won't be the ones actually making the ready to eat product. Uh, but the creation that is that is the core of our. Of, of, of what we do and also our intellectual property is how you um, how you do this that process so. yeah for sure how you get it from the the brewery to is that yeah. is that patentable or yeah it, we it actually we, yeah yeah the, the the process of not not how you get it you know pick up pick it up or whatever but how you how you process it is yeah very valuable that's too bad I missed out on this. Uh, yeah, I should have invested. Actually, damn. So did Tom? <laughs> did, did you pitch Tom on investing in this? Uh, no, it already it already had closed. What's that? No, I mean <laughs> after. Like if someone like him, people are already knowing this space. Um, no, if that's if that's a conversation that he or anyone else is listening wants to have with oh, us, gotcha. we're always we're always looking for um, strategic strategic money. You know, kind of money plus. Yeah. Uh, not all not all money is uh, is fungible. This is. Uh, Dan, this is awesome what you guys are doing. And then I'm surprised the domain regrained.com was available. Was that oh, we part? made up. Well, that- we made up. We made up the word. That's the best way to make sure the domain's available. It was like ten bucks. It's, it's still like I can't believe it was available. Yeah, I can't believe someone else didn't come up with this business <laughs> before we did. So, <laughs> so what's next? You know, um, people for one. Thanks. Dan, I appreciate it, and I, I always ask two questions on Spart Insider, and people should really, this is, you know, if you haven't gotten in early at this point, it's it's going to be huge. Uh, regrain.com, check it out. Support them by buying bars or whatever else they're doing, because they're, yeah. they're, they taste good, and they're doing good. And um, I always ask, um, what's been the lowest point, and then what's been the proudest moment? What's been? Uh, wow. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of challenges with. This. Well, have you ever seen that? There's this chart that's like a day in the life of an entrepreneur, where it's you know it kind of oscillate between those things every day, where it's like, oh my god, this is like the best thing ever. I totally know what I'm doing, and it's like, what the heck am I doing? I have no idea. I've never done this before. I don't know anything. And you kind of like oscillate between those two extremes throughout a day. Um, you know, the lowest point we haven't had a lot of just super low points there's been some micro ones where we've had for example like back when jordan and i were still in the kitchen there's been days where we like would ruin a batch or something like that and it was it felt so devastating at the time because it had implications we really needed that inventory in order to fulfill our orders in order to keep our customers happy and continue to grow and um you know you kind of can if you're not careful uh and, and and stopping these you know these these cycles you know these downward spirals of like this means this, which means that, which means this could happen. Uh, you know, that can get that can get really bad. Um, I would say one of the proudest moments that we've both had recently. We actually just came back from this big trade show. It's called Natural Products Expo West. It's out in Anaheim every year. It's kind of like a who's who in the natural food and also just natural products space. Um, we had our you know we had a booth there, and it, it occurred to me and Jordan one time when we were you know walking the floor that while we were away from our booth but not worried at all and actually kind of relieved because some of the people there knew how to be in the booth and engage the, the, the traffic and the buyers, you know, better, better than we can. And that we had this, this incredible team that, um, we just trust implicitly to represent us to the fullest and that we could kind of just like let re regrain is bigger than ourselves. It was kind of this moment where we, we realized regrain is bigger than ourselves, mm. uh, which is really important because, you know, we see, Regrained is this extension of ourselves and an ability to make an outsized impact on, on the planet, and to have to be able to grow an organization that can, um, you know, a team that can that can do that, you know, with us and also without us, um, you know, in some cases was, I guess, just a really um, you know, reassuring and, and powerful you know moment for us to have as founders. That was, um, yeah, very clear. Yeah. It's going to grow beyond you. Um, what good came out of Expo West for you? Well, this how do you the, decide to do a booth as opposed to just going and walking the show? What what made you just make the decision to get a booth? 
Yeah, so this year um, is the year that we're actually trying to grow in the marketplace and get our get our products out there. You know, we learned last year we, we were at Expo West, but we were really just learning. Uh, we're pretty wide eyed. It's a pretty overwhelming experience. Um, so this year we were set up in the the two major distributors. We know how to how to talk about our product to who. You know, we have our pricing all figured out, our distribution figured out, um, and so we were really looking to to close business. Um, and it's also just always good to for me as my my personal goal there is also just to meet uh the other leaders in the industry especially those that are focused on using their business as a force for as a force for good um but it was a very sales sales focus uh this year which is yeah. great because that's what we need to do right now dan i want to be the first one to thank you everyone check out regrained.com any other places we should point people where can people get the product they can go on amazon regrained yeah, anywhere amazon else. Amazon regrained. There's a few other places on the internet where our distribution to actual stores is pretty focused in California at this point, mm-hmm. but that's um, that's changing pretty quickly. Um, but it's always always great to get uh, get orders on our on our website, and we can have that relationship with uh, with you. And we'd love to hear from you, even if you just want to write us and let us know what you think of what we're doing or ask any questions. You know, we're very uh, you know engaged in the in the digital digital community. So thanks cool. for thanks for taking the time right. to. Hear me ramble about things. Thanks for thanks, Dan. Thanks for thanks. Everyone, check out readinggrain dot com. And at that, I'm probably going to bite into this, so I don't have to talk <laughs> anymore. So appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. We'll talk soon. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.